Good morning, Watkinsville. Let's sing together. Call upon the Lord. Lift your voice. We need no other hiding place. Our hope is safe within your name. Yes, we know. It's never to forsake What you begin you will sustain Yes we know Yes we know And I will call upon the Lord For He alone is strong enough to Every. 
invite you to open your Bibles today to Psalm 89. Psalm 89. We are just a few weeks removed from Vacation Bible School. When I think about a Vacation Bible School on our property. There's not many signs left of Bible School having taken place here. Uh, but the songs uh, still exist. There's no question in my mind that there are are a lot of vacation trips that families are taking right now where the back seat is filled with kids still uh, singing songs from Spark Studios. Those vacation Bible school songs have a way of sticking with us. Uh, those, Those songs that maybe you hear this summer, we think about from vacation Bible school, uh, they, they take us back to a place again and again. They'll remind us of a particular week, of a particular time. But before those Spark Studio songs were introduced to us, uh, there was tons of work, layers and layers of preparation, hours and hours of preparation that took place before the first note of any one of those songs ever echoed on this property. Uh, We just didn't walk in one day and start singing some independent song that had nothing to do with anything else going on around us. Uh, There were Bible stories that were studied studied beforehand. Uh, There were uh, backgrounds that were built and environments that were designed and planned Uh, There were words written to those songs. There were singers chosen to sing those songs. Uh, And then the week came alive with all of those songs, with all of that in the background. Uh, Today in our Bibles, when we come to Psalm 89, it's not just some independent song or poem that has no context, no meaning, or no background. In fact, It's the background of Psalm 89 that helps us get the impact of what's contained in this song. Uh, Psalm 89 is a song. It's a song that has as a backdrop Bible stories. It's a song where the singers were chosen. They were appointed. They had the job of writing songs and singing songs. And, and the understanding of this particular song comes from the actions and the events that took place before the song was ever written. In this song, you have references to historical events. In this song, you have references to current events. And in this song, you have references or hopes of things that might happen in the future. Uh, This is a song about history. It's a song about current events. But it's also a song about current events that have become history for us, but it's a song that points us to the future. What's the background? What's the backdrop? Before we would ever read Psalm 89 to understand what's there, What's the context in which it occurs? Well, to find that, we have to go to another book of the Bible, another story of the Bible, and that's where I want us to start today, and that's in 2 Samuel chapter 7. The theme that runs throughout Psalm 89 is a covenant that God made with King David. A covenant is a binding agreement. It is an an agreement where uh, some conditions are set, some promises are made, and between two people, they enter into this binding agreement. In that covenant, it will often state how long that covenant is supposed to last. In Psalm 89, there's a reference to this binding agreement that God made with a king in the history of Israel, the most famous king, King David. And so let's go to 2 Samuel, and I want you to hear the words to the very agreement that God made 
with David. It was a promise. It was a covenant. It was established between God and David. The words were given to a man by the name of Nathan, and Nathan delivered those words to David. 2 Samuel chapter 7, listen, beginning in verse 8 to this agreement. Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. How long? He says, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him. As I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, that, those were promises made by God through Nathan to David. When you come to Psalm 89, the writer of this song is aware of the promises that had been made to David. He was living in the context of being a part of God's covenant people. And he spends the first two-thirds of the psalm praising God for who he is, what he's learned about him in his covenant-keeping ways. He praises the Lord for that. He recognizes for the Lord for that. And then the last third of the psalm changes. And we're going to talk about that as we walk through the message today. This, uh, this psalm makes reference to one generation telling another generation about who God is and what God has done. And obviously, this has happened. Uh, this writer of this song is able to report on who God is and what God's done and how he has operated. This agreement that uh, God had made with, uh, with, with David is highlighted here and the character of God that comes through in keeping that kind of covenant. This song was written according to the heading of this psalm by a man named Ethan. It says a, a mascal of Ethan the Ezraite. Well, who were the Ezraites? The Ezraites were in the Levite family. They were the uh, musicians of the court. They were the singers and the songwriters for worship. And this particular song written by this particular individual. Ethan puts in these words in the first 18 verses, expanding praise. And it's just one verse after another of the majesty of God, particularly highlighting the steadfast love and the faithfulness of God. Let's look at these first few verses and just let the power of the word speak to our hearts. He says, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. 
With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Just some highlights as we look at these verses. The word forever is going to be a reoccurring word in these 52 verses of this psalm. Eight times the word forever is mentioned. Steadfast love and faithfulness. Seven times those two attributes of God are attached to one another. They travel together. You, you, you don't have one without the other. They're, I don't know if you would call them uh, brothers or first cousins, but they stick together. Uh, they are the attributes that, that just keep being recognized. God's hesed, the Hebrew word hesed, steadfast, loyal love, tracking with God's faithfulness. I'll sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Verse 2, for I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I've made a covenant with my chosen one. I've sworn to David, my servant. That's 2 Samuel that we just read. That's the reference back to 2 Samuel. Verse 4. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? God, greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, your rule, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crush Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you've created them. Tabor and Hermon, joyously praise your name. You have a mighty arm, strong as your hand, high your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face, who exult in your name all the day. In your righteousness are exalted, for you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted, for our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. Eighteen verses of high praise. It starts out with this declaration of this is what I'm going to sing. This is what I'm going to declare from one generation to the next. There's no question, no doubt that the writer of this song was, was totally convinced that God was this kind of God. And, and let me just highlight a few of the things that he says in verse 7. He speaks of him greatly to be feared and awesome above all. And then in verse 8, He's, in verse 9, he speaks of how nature bows to God. He says, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. It's a picture, it's a symbolic picture of, of chaos in the world. But it's also this literal picture of how, what can happen with the waves of the sea. And when you read that, you can't help but think about miracles that Jesus performed in the New Testament where he himself spoke and caused the waves of the sea to calm and there to be peace on the sea. He speaks in verse 10 of not only how nature bows before the Lord, but how nations bow. When he says, you crush Rahab like a carcass, Rahab is a picturesque word of Egypt. He says, you scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. It's a testimony of how God's children had won in battles. And then he goes to the heavens. Again, just expanding the majesty of God. And he says, the heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world, all that is in it, you found it. He said, everything in the heavens you made, you built this, you created, you're the creator. So we see that nature bows before the Lord, nations bow before the Lord, the heavens declare its glory. 
And then he pulls out extremes. Like we might say in our everyday language, everything from A to Z. Uh, well, he, he pulls out extremes. He says, the north and the south, you've created them. And he, and he pulls two mountain points. From Tabor to Hermon, they praise your name. He was, he was, he was laying out geographical extremes to show uh, where God is praised. And then he says, uh, north and the south, you've created them from one pole to the other. Again, just expanding the majesty of God, declaring his praise. Now, in verse 19, it shifts a little bit. And he goes from these 18 verses of expanded praise to beginning in verse 19, the expressions of God, the words of God that describe the covenant that God made with David. And verse 19 through 37 is as if God is speaking in this song, describing the promises that he had made. So keep tracking with this. Stay with me for a few more minutes here. You, you begin the psalm talking about the greatness of God, the steadfast love of God, the faithfulness of God. And then he raises an illustration of God's steadfast love and faithfulness in the particular item of the covenant that he made with David. Listen, verse 19, of old you spoke in a vision to your godly one and said. Who did he speak to? He spoke to Nathan. What did Nathan do with that vision? He delivered it to David. He says, I've granted help to one who is mighty. I've exalted one chosen from the people. Verse 20, I've found David, my servant. With my holy oil, I have anointed him so that my hands shall be established with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him. And in my name shall be his horn, and in my name shall, be, shall his horn be exalted. That's a, a reference to his strength. His strength would be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And I will make him the firstborn. That re that's a reference to, to rank. He wasn't literally in earth the firstborn of his family, but in rank, God would make him firstborn. He says, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My steadfast love I will keep for him forever, and my covenant will stand firm or be faithful for him. I will establish his offspring forever and his throne as the days of the heavens. Now, those are all statements that come from the Lord about all that he would do through King David in keeping his covenant. And then just like 2 Samuel made reference to if the people went away from God, they would be disciplined. That's repeated again, beginning in verse 30. Listen, he says, If his children, speaking of, of David, If his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. But I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. Again, it goes back to 2 Samuel 7. It's a statement of the Lord. I'm making a covenant. There's a binding agreement. If the people rebel against me, they'll be disciplined. But that doesn't mean that I've lifted the blessing or the presence of my steadfast love or faithfulness. Verse 33, but I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips once for all I have sworn by my holiness I will not lie to David his offspring shall endure forever his throne as long as the sun before me like the moon it shall be established forever a faithful witness in the skies 
He takes the moon. He says, just like the moon has, has existed and continues to exist, there will continue to be a faithful witness. I will not lie. Well, God describes his covenant promises. And, about, and there's a third shift that's about to happen. First 18 verses, this enormous, expanded praise of the majesty of God. Steadfast love and faithfulness. Verse 19 through 37, God expressing in this covenant, I will be steadfast, loving David. I will be faithful. I will discipline, but I will not violate my covenant. Now, verse 38 has a, a, a shocking twist. And it's, it, it almost feels like the ink ought to be written in a different color. It, it is a major transition to go from ex, this expansion of praise to an illustration of God's faithfulness in the covenant with David. Verse 38, the first two words, but now, but now. And what happens from verse 38 to verse 51, there are 52 verses, but from verse 38 to verse 51 is the writer of this song giving expression to their current circumstances. And his testimony is this, God, from one generation to the other, we praise you, we exalt you, we fear you, we've seen your steadfast love, we've seen your faithfulness. And then verse 19 through 37, God saying, yes, I am steadfast, I do love, I, I am faithful, I am keeping the covenant, I will not break that. It is a forever covenant to the writer of this song saying, that's who you were, that's who you've been, but not so much now. In other words, it's like we might say today, what have you done for me lately? And he gives testimony from verse 38 to 51 to circumstances that seemingly don't match what his understanding of steadfast love and faithfulness is. He says, but now you've cast off and you've rejected you're full of wrath against your anointed. You've renounced the covenant with your servant. You've defiled the crown and the dust. You've breached all the walls. You've laid the strongholds in ruins. All who pass by plunder him. He's become the scorn of his neighbors. You've exalted the right hand of his foes. You've made all his enemies rejoice. You've also turned back the edge of his sword, and you have not made him stand in battle. You have made his splendor to cease and cast his throne to the ground. You've cut short the days of his youth. You've covered him with shame. How long, O oh Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. He's saying, do something in my lifetime. Do something right now. Do something before the sun goes down on my life. For what vanity you've created all the children of man. What man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Lord, where's your steadfast love of old, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? Remember, O oh Lord, how your servants are mocked and how I bear in my heart the insults of all the many nations with which your enemies mock, O oh Lord, with which they mock the footsteps of your anointed. Two-thirds of the psalm, God's a covenant-keeping God. The last third of the psalm, the words turn to, but I can't see it. It's not happening now. Lord, what are you doing? Where's your covenant? Where's your word? It seems like you've forgotten. It seems like we're abandoned. Now, with about 10 minutes left in this message, you maybe would be excited to know or encouraged to know that this message from Psalm 89 is a one-point sermon. And here's the one point I want to drive home from these 52 verses. 
the limitations of our finite experience doesn't determine the character of an infinite God. The limitations of our finite experience doesn't determine the character of an infinite God. So from the beginning, we have to recognize that we're dealing with a context of forever. Everything that we know, God created except he himself. And he has no beginning and no end. And in the context of infinity, we have a limited experience. And what the songwriter of Psalm 89 raises is God's infinite character. And what the songwriter raises is God's own word that I do not lie and I will not forsake this covenant. I've made a covenant forever. But in that finite world of this songwriter, we see ourselves. And what I learned from this passage in my limited lifetime of age zero to whatever, let's just say I live to be 100. In those 100 years, what my experience is in those 100 years does not determine what God's character is over an infinite span. You see, when I sit down in my life and look at what God's doing, I see just a blip. It's like a person sitting in the stands watching a parade. We see the floats as they pass by. We can't see what's happening beyond us or what's happening before that. We see what's right there. With the Lord, we can't see all that he's doing. We know history, and that's what this songwriter knew. He knew what God had done in the past, but he also knew his current events. But when you and I look back, even from our time frame, what the writer of this song saw as current events is now history for us. And what he understood God to be doing right in that very moment is much bigger and much broader and much more fulfilled than he could ever see. And we're able to look back and see how things changed and how God worked even beyond this person's lifetime. The writer spoke of history. The writer spoke of current events. He spoke of the future. But what was future for Ethan writing this song is part of history for us now. And here's, here's the example. In his limited view, if he used his circumstances to determine the character of God, he would have declared God broke his covenant. But just from where we stand, in our point in this limited experience, we look and we see God didn't break his covenant. And all we have to do is go back to the New Testament. And when you open up the very first verse in the very first book of the New Testament, it begins with this statement. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And from the beginning of the New Testament, listen, this is about 500, some just calendar people put it at, at being 539 years later. So 539 years later, what this writer of this song thought had not happened, we see that in God's time was happening. And as you track through the New Testament, 59 times King David is referred to. 
And what you see over and over and over again is that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the covenant that was made with David in that his throne had continued and that Jesus was the fulfillment of the covenant that God had made with David all the way back in 2 Samuel. Now the writer of Psalm 89 only might think of that as being in the future, but in his current circumstances, he couldn't see it. But we look back and we see that God was working and he was involved. And even though it took 539 years, God in his infinite working and plans was doing something that he couldn't even see. In Luke chapter 1, the angel comes and, and makes a, a, a declaration to, to Mary. Listen to these verses. Luke 1, verse 31. The angel speaking to Mary says, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob how long forever and of his kingdom there will be no end now let's bring it right into our world in 2022 what does this do for us what it does for me and I hope will do for you is to help me realize that my limited Ability to see all that God's doing doesn't change his character and it doesn't mean that I've been abandoned by God. And God's character remains the same. And it's not that his character has changed, it's how does God's character show up in times that don't make sense to me. Several years ago, I remember the very first time I was at an amusement park where they had those uh, old like Model T cars that uh, they would let kids drive and you, you, you get on these Model T cars and drive it all over the place in the amusement park and just thought that was so grand and like I was really doing something. You realize as you get older that the reason they let you drive those cars is because all of those cars were attached to a track. And, and, and that car could only operate in certain ways. It was affected by what it was attached to. And that's a picture to me for, for my life, for your life, for our lives as children of the Lord. That it, it can look like to us that up ahead is a major turn. We can be in something currently that looks like a, a, a major crash. But God's steadfast love and faithfulness are the tracks that our lives keep running on. Imagine with me in your mind a, a railroad track and the, and the rail that the train runs on. One of those rails is steadfast love and one of those rails is faithfulness. And we're traveling those tracks. And you know on those tracks they have those cross beams that you cross over as you ride those rails. Well, imagine each one of those cross beams are things that we experience in life like defeat or disease or disappointment or discouragement, trouble, silence, death. We keep crossing over those things. What stays constant? What stays consistent? Those parallel tracks of steadfast love and faithfulness. So that whatever I cross, I stay on track because I'm tied to the steadfast love and faithfulness of God. Today, when you listen and you think about your life and the events of these days and how this psalm might apply, remember that your life through Jesus Christ is held in track, on course, by his steadfast love 
and faithfulness. Over time, as we experience griefs and joys and discipline and chastisement and blessing, it's still guided by God's steadfast love and faithfulness. So what do we do? Just four statements and I'm done. What do we do when it seems like on the track of life we just keep crossing things that could derail us? Number one, ask the Spirit of God to reveal any sin in your life. Ask the Spirit of the Lord. Say, is there anything that is wrong? Anything I need to confess? Anything I need to repent of? Is there something going on in my life that's just... It's a result of being out of fellowship with the Lord. And, and like the psalmist, they search me and try me and see if there's any unclean thing in my heart. And the Bible gives us the promise if we confess our sins to the Lord, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Number two, pray according to the character of God, not according to your circumstances. Say, so Lord, you are steadfast in your love. You are faithful. You are great. You are the creator. And so, Lord, be who you are in my life today. Number three, learn who he is. Get to know him. Grow in your knowledge of him. Number four, worship him. The very last verse of Psalm, 50, of Psalm 89 is so critical because even in the midst of all of those verses where the songwriter is saying, God, where are you? Have you forgotten us? How long, O oh Lord? He ends the psalm by saying, blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. He's saying, this is what my experience is. But even though I don't get it all and I don't understand it all, I praise you. I praise you. And until it makes sense... Just keep praising the Lord. Keep trusting him. Keep relying on his character that doesn't change. Keep relying on his steadfast love. Keep leaning on his faithfulness. Worship him for who he is, just like the psalmist did. And then last and finally, trust him. When this verse ends with amen and amen, it is the psalmist saying, Lord, let it be. I put it in your hands. I don't get it all. I don't understand it all, but I'm going to praise you for your steadfast love. I'm going to praise you for your faithfulness. I'm going to worship you, and I'm going to let you have it. Amen and amen. Father, I pray today that you would take Psalm 89 and show us, Lord, that we're limited. But our limitations don't change who you are. We praise you today in the midst of things we don't get or we don't understand. We praise you because of what we know is true. And that is you are steadfast and you are faithful. And Lord, would you work in those listening right now? Would you work in all of our lives according to that very character. We leave it with you. Amen and amen.